also was going to ask, maybe Tracy, you could do this, or someone. I'm a little worried that if you don't find it, oh, there's no lights on, that's good. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't find it, um, maybe you could accompany her and Xerox really quickly, so the, this assignment. Yeah, we have two, so. Okay, great. Okay, so in case you connect with Chris and Tracy here. Okay, Phil, are you back there, or Dan, or somebody? Hi, guys, I think I'm ready. Okay. Oh, I'm on. <laughs> oh, good. Um, oh, yeah, there I am. You're right. All right, I'd like to start with this. This is a quick minute before we jump back to 1925. This will be on our website for those future viewers of this, um, of this tape who are wondering what's going on here, no doubt. Um, this is a text that I'm interested in that gives us snippets of Latin American fiction just to consolidate our notions of what magical realism is. Let's just read through them quickly together. I've given you three examples that I call ethnographic stance. They're magical realism that's based in the clash of two very different cultures, so that that most characteristic aspect of magical realism, the duality or plurality of incompatible worlds, the flesh and blood angel, if you want. Is it an angel? Is it a man? Is it a hawk? Is it an airplane? We never know that is sometimes comes out of the American territory. We're going to read Alejo Carpentier, our third example. We aren't going to read The Lost Steps. We're going to read The Kingdom of This World. But he says, oh, well, magical realism, he calls it lo real maravilloso, can only be an American phenomenon. Because in America, we have cultures that mix and match and merge and collide and collapse and so forth. And so he, this is this ethnographic stance that ties it to a particular territory where there are cultures that collide. That has been extended, of course, in post-colonial discourse so that we have a great Nigerian novel by Ben Okri, The Famished Road. I was just mentioning it to Nkechi. Um, or we have a, a Moroccan example. In our textbook, we see plenty of different examples of magical realism that are not American or Latin American, but they're post-colonial. So that ethnographic stance, as I call it, has to do with the class of cultures. Look at what Hernán Cortés says in his letter to the Emperor Charles V in 1520. 1521, a date we all should know, the fall of Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City, the fall of the Aztec or Mexica Empire uh, to 700 soldiers led, Spanish soldiers led by Cortés. Cortés wrote back to his patron like crazy. He says, you can't imagine what I've found here. I can't, words cannot tell. I don't have words in my language to describe it. And he calls an Aztec temple, he calls it a mosque. A mosque, because that's an, another kind of church. Uh, so, so he doesn't have the language, and that's what he's saying here. Let, let's just read it. There are so many things in the new continent, and of such kinds, that because of the great number of them, and because I do not remember them all, and also because I do not know what to call them, I cannot relate them. That magic or mystery that hides and palpitates behind the real, as Franz Roe is saying. Well, do we count the letters of Cortes to Charles V, Carlos V, the first Habsburg king of the new world, of half of the uh, known world. Do we call that letter magical realism? No. We call it writing to your patron and telling him of all of these wondrous, unspeakable, unnamed things. Um, we don't call it magical realism, but it's, you start to get the idea. Here's a Westerner trying to say something about a world that is radically other. And he says, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. Okay, same thing with Bernal Castilla, uh, Diaz, Diaz del Castillo, perdón, Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He was Cortés's favorite lieutenant. Fifty years later, Bernal Diaz writes up the story of the conquest of Mexico. It's a fascinating tome. It seems he never forgot a single detail. It's super detailed. It's called The True History, well, here's the title, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, written in 1568, more or less 40-some years after 1521. Uh, so. He writes, again, this is the most famous passage of a very famous account of this amazing meeting of two worlds that had no inkling of each other before that meeting. Uh, 
the Mexican, of course, cultures and, and the European. These great towns and buildings, ah, they're crossing over. Cortes lands in 1519 on the coast, the Gulf Coast at Veracruz. He invents the town that's now Veracruz. He sets a cross in the, in the sand and says, this is the true cross, Veracruz. Um, and then he, he takes two years to get over the mountains and up to the high plain where the great Aztec city of Tenochtitlan is. And as they're going across the mountains, they see for the first time this huge Aztec city, now a huge Mexican city, hugest in the world, as you know. Um, and he says, oh my gosh, it's like a dream. That's the best he can come up with. And he cites a medieval romance, a chivalric romance, the Amadis de Gaula. Look at it. He says, these great towns and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis, like Arthurian legends, except in the span. The most famous example is Amadis of Gaul, de Gaula, who, uh, so, so all of these fairy stories. This reminds me of a fairy tale, he says. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. Is it not surprising, therefore, that I should write in this vein? It was all so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed of before. So again, you start to see this ethnographic stance, right? There's such a magic here, such a magic that the world is suddenly expanded, but I have no idea of the parameters of that world because I can't even speak the names of the things. OK, and one more, and now 1953, we've jumped uh, quite, quite a ways. And this is Carpentier reviving this notion that the perfect territory for magical realism is the, um, is the American territory because of the mix mixing and matching and meeting of cultures that do not know how to name each other. So there's that inevitable mystery about the American territory. This is not my favorite novel by hi him. In fact, we're reading, I think, my favorite novel, The Kingdom of This World, written in 90, 1949. But Carpentier is essential in defining the magical realist genre in contemporary literature. It starts with him, in a way. I feel invaded by the vertigo of the abyss. I know that this is the narrator speaking. The narrator's taking a trip into, um, oh boy, into the jungle. He's a musicologist. You don't need to know more. But it's, it's, it's an urban, westernized American meeting, again, that uh, unknown America, that territory uh, th that isn't western. I feel invaded by the vertigo of the abyss. I know that if I allowed myself to be captivated by what I see here in this prenatal world, in this world that existed before there were eyes to see it, I would end up throwing myself, sinking myself into this thick mass of leaves that will disappear from the planet one day without having been named, without having been recreated by the word. Again, that prob problem of naming. How can you talk about something that you don't know what it's called? OK, so it, I think I've made my point. Any comments about this, this ethnographic stance? Call it cultural collision stance. Call it whatever you, you want to. Um, but it comes out of a cultural dualism or pluralism where in a realistic novel, that pluralism would be resolved. That would be, they would be reconciled. Here, there's a sense, throw up your hands. I can't name it. How am I going to say that? How can I talk about this? So it opens the way for a space of diversity, of cultural diversity, that is the, the primary characteristic, I think, of magical realism and why it is so attractive to post-colonial writers. Okay, now I've given you category two, which is realismo magico, or magical realism. And this, I say, is an ontological stance. Now, I've already described that term ontology. That it's the study of being, the study of the nature of reality, if you want. And so an ontological question is, what is it? The, all of what we saw on Thursday of the... Um, both of the Garcia Marquez short stories ask ontological questions. Is light like water? Well, yeah, I guess it is. That's sort of an odd thing in my view, that you can flood an apartment, etc. Or what is the nature of that old man? And remember, we looked at that beautiful sentence about eggplant mush. 
we never the people never knew whether he was an angel or because it was he because he was an angel or because he was a very old man that he ate nothing but eggplant mush so so that ontological stance is the one that asks us as readers to say what kind of reality is this? What's real? Is it true? How can these things be true at once? So let's just look at a few examples. I, I've kind of, in my own notes, made them examples of a particular aspect of doubt, of indeterminacy. The first, of course, here we have a very old man with enormous wings, a tail for children. And I think here the, the doubt is most essentially about the self. The self. Who, how can somebody be an angel is it true that people have wings? I mean, all of these are, we know we're reading a piece of fiction and we know mainly people don't have wings, but the story doesn't let us know that. The movie did. Remember I told you he takes off his wings. It won't work. Okay, so let's just do this wonderful sentence here again. At first they tried to make him eat some mothballs, which according to the wisdom of the wise neighbor woman were the food prescribed for angels. But he turned them down just as he turned down the papal lunches that the penitents brought him, and they never found out whether it was because he was an angel or because he was an old man that in the end he ate nothing but eggplant mush. Indeterminacy of the self. Okay, then an example from Carlos Fuentes. Um, we're not reading him in this class, but he's the greatest living Mexican novelist. He's a man 76 or 7. He just got a big prize from the University of Houston in the spring, the Farfell Award, our most uh, distinguished honor. Um, uh, a Farfell Lecture, I'm sorry. And then, then there's an award as associated with that Maybe some of you heard him. I think I asked, didn't you? Did I ask if you'd heard him? William, did you hear him when he was here? Fuentes? I, I guess I asked in my other class someone had. Um, anyway, Terra Nostra is a brick of a novel. I used to teach it. I got tired of teaching it. It's a very interesting and hard book. But I've chosen here a, um, a passage that gives, asks an ontological question about time. You know, we have our notions of time. They're calendars, they're clocks. Time is more or less linear in Western culture. I can count it tomorrow. We'll have a certain relationship today and to today and so forth. But look what he's doing here. Hi history in magical realism is often evoked by alternative histories, confront confrontations of chronology, if you want. And that's what's going on here. Look, he says, the narrator says, see upon the combined canvases of my theater the passage of the most absolute of memories, the memory of what could have been but was not. See it in its greatest and least important detail, in gestures not fulfilled, in words not spoken, in choices sacrificed, in decisions postponed. See Cicero's patient silence as he hears of Catiline's foolish plot. Of course, Cicero made a great oration on the subject. So we're, we're seeing the opposite. Think of the alternative history. See how Calpurnia convinces Caesar not to attend the Senate on the Ides of March. See the defeat of the Greek army in Salamis. See the birth of a baby girl in a stable in Bethlehem in Palestine during the reign of Augustus. So that notion of alternative history. OK, so what's time? What's history? How are we going to figure that out? Another one of the ontological subversions if you want, of our certainties, our Western notions of plot and setting and character uh, and so forth. Another one from Fuentes, I, I count this a, an ontological subversion of cultural identity, or let's just say a subversion, let's leave the word ontology out, it's not so much an ontological subversion as a disruption of our understanding of reality. Here's the question, what's in question is cultural identity and also objects that may behave magically. Fuentes writes, every identity is nurtured from all other identities. Nothing disappears completely. Everything is transformed. Transformed. What we believe to be dead has but changed place. What is, is thought. See how he's just taking a shovel and digging out. It's like the sand is, is sort of opening under our, our feet here in, the, in this cultural uh, identity way, but you know, everything is everything. Well, no, <laughs> not in my world, but in Terra, Terra Nostra's world, 
we're asked to embrace, we're asked to include in ways we might not be in the realistic novel. I'm not going to read this whole passage from Elena Garro's Recollections of Things to Come. I count on you to read it. The narrator is a stone. The narrator is a rock on which the town used to sit before it disappeared. A village, northern Mexico, terrible political stuff goes on in the post-revolutionary period, and the town simply goes away. But we hear the echoes of those ghostly voices. So um, I, I won't read it. We don't need to read it. But here, the narrator is a very different kind of narrator. So again, this subversion of our expectations of how the solid world of the novel, the realistic novel, should be. Then the last Jorge Luis Borges we are seeing, of course, let me, let's do this, it's so beautiful. The Dream Tigers, El Hacedor, the maker, is the actual title of the volume in, in um, Spanish. It was translated Dream Tigers, which is a nice title. It's little thoughts. If you ever are in half-price books and you see a little old volume, UT Press published it. I don't usually assign Dream Tigers. What I assign is labyrinths. And by the way, thank you for whoever it was, you, sir, who pointed out to me that the, li the bookstore was not on top of that one. One more report that Borges is out of print. I say, no, it's like Garcia Marquez. Of course he's not. And so there was a confusion about which edition. So they've ordered it. It'll be in next week. It's a nice black and white thinnish thing called Labyrinth. So that's the one we'll be using. But let me let us read here together the epilogue to Dream Tigers, 1960. A man sets himself the task of portraying the world. Through the years, he peoples a space of images of provinces, kingdoms, mountains, bays, ships, islands, fishes, rooms, instruments, stars, horses, and people. Shortly before his death, he discovers that the patient labyrinths of lines trace the image of his face. So he thinks he's constructing the world. The world, in the end, has constructed him. A very nice and beautiful, and, and we know that to be true, but he's reminding us that we're not the, uh, the constructive self that we may think, and we're the self constructed by, spoken by the world rather than speaking it. So it's a very beautiful, again, I mean, is that a magical real text? Not really. I happen to love it, so I put it on the sheet, but it's, um, it's, it, it points to this reorientation, this restructuring that's going on by Latin American writers, whether for cultural purposes or, or in the latter case, for the purposes of subverting our certainties, our, ontolo our ontological certainties. We ask, what is it? We're forced to by the text. OK, comments or questions about that? It's just kind of, I was hoping to do that at the end of last session. We didn't get to it. But now we've seen from 1520 to much more recently in these passages and in the stories of last time. Now we're going to go to 1925, the first time that the term was used in art historical discourse. It was used by Novalis, and our essay for Thursday talks about it. Um, Irene Gunther, a former student of ours, now teaches at the, um, the, the um, at HCC, wrote the essay where and a former student of mine, and I was thrilled that I needed to plug this hole in this collection. We, need to, we needed to see what was going on in Germany before we can take it to Latin America, and Irene wrote a great essay, in my view. So we ha we'll see that next time. Um, what we want to do today is look at Franz Rowe, which is an easy little essay, I think. He repeats himself quite a lot. Wendy and I excerpted this from it's page 15, uh, excerpted it from a longer text, but we wanted to emphasize certain things about the definition of magical realism as it's first used in 1925 by a German art historian in a German essay that gets translated to uh, Spanish right after, in 1927. So there's a, there's a particular person, we'll talk a little bit more about him, Jose Ortega y Gasset, who's reading a lot of German philosophy in the 20s, translating it in his very famous magazine Revista de Occidente into Spanish. So, but nonetheless, this is it's not something that is translated immediately into Latin America. It takes until Car Carpentier in 1949. Okay, so what's going on in Germany in 1925? It's the post-war period, of course. 
it's also the post-expressionist period. Expressionist art is, I should have more pictures to show you. I have lots of examples of what Rowe is calling magical realism. But magical realism is contesting an earlier abstraction. So it's a bit the opposite of what we've been saying about the use of Latin American magical realism to contest realism. He's saying, is he not? You've read the essay. Oh boy, oh boy, goody, goody, we've got figures again in painting. It's no longer abstraction. Now the objects in the world, we can touch and feel them again. And this is wonderful, he's saying. So he's really, um, and I think we say that in our little editor's note, um, but look at the, the very famous passage that we quote in our editor's note because we didn't select that um, part of, the, of his text. But you see, you see here in the introduction the mention of Jose Ortega y Gasset, a very famous Spanish philosopher who was very influenced by German philosophers and art historians. And so you've got that background here in your textbook. But let's read together this famous statement that we cite here and then we refer to, we refer to it in the first paragraph of our editor's note and then again we cite it. And see, this is the sum total of his argument. There are a few other things, but if you get this point, you got it, I think. I attribute no special value to the title magical realism. Since the work had to have a name, the work, these paintings that he's talking about that I'm going to show you in a minute, the work had to have a name that meant something, and the word post-expressionism only indicates ancestry and chronological relation after, it comes after expressionism, but that doesn't say what it is. He says, I added the first title, Magical Realism, quite a long time after having written this work. It seems to me, this is the work that came out in 1925, it seems to me at least more appropriate than ideal realism or verism or neoclassicism, which only designate an aspect of the movement. Superrealism means at this time something else. With the word magic, and this is the phrase I love, with the word magic as opposed to mystic, I wish to indicate that the mystery does not descend to the represented world, but rather hides and palpitates behind it as will become clear in what follows. So that the magic that hides and palpitates behind the real world. It's a bit, think of Cortez, how can I name the wonders? Um, it's, it posits a whole space that is larger than what we see, what we can name, what we can touch. That magic hides and palpitates behind the concretions of the real world. And that's what he's celebrating in this work. Now, you know, I'm tempted, I think I'll start maybe Phil or anybody back there, um, the PowerPoint. I thought I'd go through the essay first, but I just changed my mind. I want to um, show you some of the work that he's talking about. You will have skipped perhaps ahead and seen some of the illustrations in Irene Gunther's essay for Thursday. But here, there's a list of artists. This will be on our VISTA site, so you can look again. But I've grouped, first I've given you six examples of the most important ones. Radziwill, De Chirico, who's the most famous, and his work looks a lot like this, very stark, very hyper-real, very clean lines. You can see why this idea of magic hiding and palpa palpitating behind uh, the objective world, the objects of the world, is one that would occur to Franz Rowe as he looked at these artists and what they were doing. So de Chirico is somebody you should know, as you should Radziwill, whom we just saw. I'm going to go through these again. But this is to give you a visual uh, preview of what then we're going to look at Rowe saying. Otto Dix is the most grotesque, I think, of the painters. We're going to see more of him, but you can see the, defor the deformation. At the same time, it's hyper real. It doesn't look like real children. That's why he calls it magical realism. It's a very different sort of realism, even though we recognize them perfectly well as children. So you see there's playing, it's playing with the mimesis and the poesis uh, that we we didn't talk about in the introduction to, to our volume. Mimetic art is imitative art. You're to think that it looks like a real vase of flowers or two real children. You wouldn't look at this and say, or you'd say, wow, that's a very odd 
mimesis. It's here the em emphasis is on what the artist is doing with it, on the poesis, on the making. Poetry comes from the, the root in Greek meaning to make. Henry Rousseau, the dream, you will recognize him. We're going to see a whole bunch more of his in a minute. But he's one of the fellows as well that's part of this. He's French. He's not German, of course. And, and Rowe was interested, as de Chirico is Italian. It wasn't just because the German art historian is looking at the art. It doesn't mean he wasn't talking about the French and, and Italian artists as well uh, and others besides. But you see, again, this kind of, I guess I'd call it hyperrealism. And then this one, which is included in our book, um, Irene Gunther takes it as a particular example of a cityscape. There was a lot of cityscapes and one landscape that is in her essay as well. But Carl Grossberg, another of the of these artists, this is dated 27. So, and I'm going to show you some that are post 25. But these artists are a bit of a group, and they're the ones that are getting this early label of magical realism in German. And then George Gross, 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 um, who who again is um, is uh, grotesque in in a way. We've already let's just go back real quickly. This is kind of fun. This is the first time I've ever done PowerPoint. How am I doing? <laughs> Thank you. See, Otto Dix is one of our grotesques. Let's say and. George Gross is another. But there you get six or seven of the main. I'm going to now get into others. So let's just go back and we'll look at this pretty background while we, while we talk a little bit about Franz Rowe. When Franz Rowe in 1927 published a longer version of the 25 essay, this, and it was translated into Spanish, he used Henry Rousseau on the cover. And I don't have an image of it. It's it's called the um, guitar player. It's a lion and a guitar player. I, I have a slide slide someplace, but I didn't have it scanned. You get the idea, though. Henry Rousseau is there's. Can can you imagine 1925 in Germany? He's been writing this since since this essay. He's been working on it a while. These painters have been painting. We can say, well, the dream 1910. It's before anyone imagined World War One. So maybe that's <coughs> why it's calm and quiet. But that's one of the things he loves. Let's just look at a few passages in the essay. Then we'll look at some more of the images, and you can see what he's talking about. <coughs> So, um, let me just point out some passages. Is that OK? Or do you guys want to pass, point out passages that interested you? Maybe I'll do mine first. And then when I skip the ones you most loved, you can remind me. We've already looked at this one that, for me, is crucial. Mystery hides magic. Oh, not mystery. Magic hides and palpitates behind the real world, behind the object. So. Look at the beginning of the, I'm just going to read you or read together a few passages where he's making this point. Look at below the middle of page 16, we have an, a paragraph that begins, we will indicate here in a cursory way the point at which the new painting separates itself from expressionism by means of its objects. Let's go back to my, I start with my very, very favorite, by means of its objects. Expressionism is abstraction. There's a lot of activity. I, I should show you some expressionism so you can see what it's departing from. But here, um, you see what he means about the object. Now, skip over to 17, the middle paragraph there. Let us glance at the pictures re reproduced at the end of this book. You're looking at some of them here. There were a whole lot in black and white. It seems to us that this fantastic dreamscape has completely vanished and that our real world reemerges before our eyes, bathed in the clarity of a new day. We recognize this world, although now, not only because we have emerged from a dream, of abstraction, we look at, on it with new eyes. The religious and transcendental themes have largely disappeared in recent painting. In contrast, we are offered a new style that is thoroughly of this world, that celebrates the mundane. Instead, and mundane here means worldly. I think that's a bad translation. Wendy translated. Um, 
mundane has a negative context, a, a, a connotation in English meaning ordinary, and I mean mundane of this world, mundo, of course. But here, we should have said celebrates the world, I think, or the, or the everyday. The extraordinariness of the everyday. Household objects fly in their, on their own wings through the kitchen sky, right? Instead of the mother of God, the purity of the shepherdesses in the field, shrimp, instead of the remote horrors of hell, the inextinguishable horrors of our own time, gross and dicks, I've told you those are our two grotesques, right? It feels as if that roughshod and frenetic transcendentalism, the devilish detour, the flight from the world have died, and now an insatiable, <laughs> the music background music changes, and now an insatiable love, insatiable love for terrestrial things and a delight in their fragmented and limited nature has reawakened. The familiar has been defamiliarized. We can look at it with new eyes because these painters are showing us things we couldn't see about the object before them. The concept of defamiliarization, you may know, it's actually a literary critical concept. The Russian formalist, Viktor Sklavsky, who writes an essay on defamiliarization, is talking about the novel. He says, ah, the novel exists to make the stone stony, he says. That the art makes us aware of our, of our, of, of our reality, that we see it newly, we see it differently. And it's true. Why would we read a novel if we didn't have insights into our own lives after reading it? That's the point, it seems to me. So that's a bit what's going on here. Go on, if you will, to page 18. He loves it that there is a calm about this work after the fiery, this is the first full paragraph on 18, all heads, hands, bodies, you see? Got it? All heads, hands, bodies, objects that express convulsive life, fiery exultation. In short, anything nervous has become suspect in this new art, for which nervousness represents wasted forces. You know, so the calm after the storm of the war, expressionism's um, abstract energy. Now we get these beautiful objects. <laughs> so he's saying, phew. Uh, so he stresses that the magic hides and palpitates behind the object, and he stresses that those objects are quiet and calm. We're going to see plenty of objects in magical realist texts that are not quiet or calm at all, but this is something that he's stressing in this art, and when we see more of it, we're going to see why. He looks at the art, and he comes up with categories for describing it, and calmness, exterior calm, imperturbable duration, he says. I'll show you that in a minute. But look again at this passage at the top of 18, the short paragraph at the top of 18, all heads, hands, bodies, objects that express convulsive life, fiery exaltation. In short, anything nervous has become suspect in this new art for which nervousness represents wasted force. Truly vigorous life is imagined to be civil, metallic, restrained. We don't need to describe in detail the kinds of men, women, children, animals, trees, and rocks that we produced in the past. He's saying it's a new way of seeing now. And then he repeats this point on page 22, if you'll zip over there, to the top of page 22. Again, he's interested in the, the static quality. But static, in his view, is good, not bad. But it's not all that dynamism and all that movement that has um, preceded it in expressionism. Look. Look at the very top line of page 22. So just as with futurism, another avant-garde movement, as this is an avant-garde movement, magical realism in art, just as with futurism, the miracle of re realistic depiction appeared quickly in the midst of abstraction, only to lose itself again. So post-expressionism post offers us the miracle of Note the italics, they're his. Existence in its imperturbable duration. The unending miracle of eternally mobile and vibrating molecules. Only out of that flux, no, sorry, out of that flux, that constant appearance and disappearance of material, permanent objects somehow appear. In short, the marvel by which a variable commotion crystallizes into a clear set of constants. This miracle of an apparent 
persistence and duration in the midst of a demoniacal flux. This enigma of total quietude in the midst of general becoming. That's one of the great lines of the essay, in my view. This enigma of total quietude in the midst of general becoming of universal dissolution. So what he's looking at, he's saying art can calm us after this terrible cataclysm. I mean, he's not talking about the war, he's talking about art. But you just see, you, you feel the sigh of relief. We finally now have a kind of art that can consolidate for us all of that uh, dissolution. So that total quietude in the midst of general becoming is something he very much appreciates, and we'll see a lot more of it when we see more examples in a minute. Now, I want to go keep on rushing right through here. See how easy this is? <laughs> um, well, one more nice little passage on page 24 that says the same thing one more time, in my view. Um, it's three quarters of the way down the page, a sentence that begins, when. Do you see it? When, in violent reaction to this, expressionism had crystallized the object's exclusive internal a aspect. That is, an abstraction that gives us a psychic state. That's what expressionism, that's where the title comes from. And it's, it's an internal expression, but in very often very movemented brush strokes and heavy paint and abstraction. He says, when in reaction to this, expressionism had crystallized the object's internal aspect the unusual opportunity of looking at the object up close from the <coughs> other side had arrived. To me, this is the magical realist moment. There's that duality again. We're going to look at the object from the other side, and we're going to see something about it that we couldn't see beforehand, before this art. So we're to looking at the object close up from the other side. You want to say, what other side? But what he means is we get another perspective on the, issue, on the object. In other words, the opportunity of reconstructing the object, starting exclusively from our interiority. So we won't belabor this point, but what, he's, what he, I think he's doing for us here is saying, look at the magic in the everyday world. We have this opportunity through this painting now to realize that the world itself, these objects are somehow, if we look at the other side, whatever other side means, we look at it from a different angle, we're going to see something we, we couldn't see before. He, he ends this section with a reference to Kanolt, K-A-N-O-L-D-T. You see him in the second to last paragraph before the typographic space in page 25. I don't, on page 25, I don't have pictures of him, but I will shortly. He's wonderful also and does, uh, again, the kind of beautifully contained crystal clear guitar on a table or still life with a pitcher. I, I overlooked Canold and I made a mistake in doing that, so we'll, we'll see him too eventually. Now, a couple more. He, the last section, I think it's the last, yes, is this thing about size. We decided, Wendy and I, as we're taking, <laughs> cherry picking his, his sections, to do one on, small, on the miniature. And magnitude and miniatureness, because in part that is an issue in magical realist analysis. We're going to start with the, the, the maximalist, Garcia Marquez, we're going to go to the minimalist, Borges. And some of the things he says about the way that magical realist painting takes a lot of little aspects, a lot of little things, and makes them into a cosmic whole. We're going to remember when we read the Aleph by, by Jorge Luis Borges. It, it, echoes nicely with Borges. So let me just point out a couple more passages now about this business of size. Um, look about six, seven lines up from the bottom of 27, if you don't mind. He refers to a painting that I now have a note on my desk to go get a slide of and have it scanned to show you, Altdorfer's Battle of Alexander. Does anybody have that image in his or her mind's eye? I'll, I'll get it for you. Um, it's a big battle scene with tons of stuff going on. So he's, he's talking about this, and let's look, look at it. The intrinsic miniature, do you see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines up bottom, from the bottom of 27. The intrinsic miniature, which can encompass also very large paintings, a typical example, example of which is Altdorfer's Battle of Alexander. Lots of teeny little things. Any little part of it is a miniature, but it's a big miniature. That's what he's saying. 
is art produced by attempting to locate infinity in small things. This is the idea of the miniature that takes its inspiration from a special way of intuiting the world. He means his magical realist painters. He's still talking about them. And as such can apply to all the arts, even music. Its opposite pole is another feeling for life which animates monumental art, an idea that applies equally to all the arts. This idea of monumentality is not limited to external dimensions. This idea of monumentality doesn't mean it has to be big. That's what he's saying. For example, the Lace Maker by Vermeer, which I expect you'll have an idea of Vermeer in your head. I'm going to get that slide too. The Lace Maker by Vermeer is a little painting the size of a plate that nevertheless produces the impression of a poster the size of a house. The miniature and the monument are two poles situated beyond the development of styles, at a distance from known spiritual models. For this reason, they must be investigated on their own terms. And he continues to compare these things. But I keep Vermeer and Altdorfer, and I'll get those slides and show you them, in mind when we're going to do Garcia Marquez, the monumentalist, or the maximalist, as I call him, and Borges, who writes his teeny little three-page stories about the entire universe. Who knows the Library of Babel? Anybody? Yeah. It's about a huge structure, and it's a teeny little st story. Um, and then look at his final metaphor in this section, Rose. I love this metaphor because I love Baroque altarpieces. And he's speaking of Baroque altarpieces in the middle of page 30. He says, think of a Baroque altarpiece. I'll show you plenty of pictures of those. Um, that's that's the subject that I have lots and lots of images about. And I, but if you've been in Mexico or Latin America, Peru, Colombia, you you know how the the front of the church is a huge piece, often of woodwork, and often gold leafed, with statues standing here and there, and paintings and cherubs and da 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 da. da. And it's meant to the parts are more than the sum. Uh, how does it go? The whole is more than the sum of the parts. That's meant to be heaven and earth and all of God's creation. Of course, you can't fit that in the front of a church, all of God's creation. So you put an image of totality. And that's what he's talking about in this last uh, paragraph. Look, it's the last paragraph, one, two, three, four, five, six lines down. On entering the church, the ensemble of an altar painting unfolded its essential meaning at a hundred paces. You say, ooh, that's big and God is great. That's the essential meaning of that glorious display in uh, the Baroque church. And then at a at the d as the distance diminished, revealed little by little the new world of the very small in successive planes of details, details that were symbolic of all true spiritual knowledge of the world because they always remain subordinate to the total structure. So that idea that the miniature and the monumental are in relation and the, the use of this particular example, um, I think, is, is nice. He goes on and says something about they offer secrets that delight us and intimate charms and so forth. So um, he's interested in the effect, the affective relation of the viewer to the, to the work of art. In fact, that's what he's talking about the whole time. It makes him feel good. It makes him feel quiet, calm. It makes him feel that he's in a world that's meaningful again, that even has excessive meaning. That is meaning you can't know altogether. So, so it's, a, it's a kind of homage, really, I think, this essay to this group of, of painters. Comments before we see some more examples or questions? Did you read the essay more or less this way? OK. I said excessive meaning. There's this wonderful idea that a Latin American writer whom I love, Julio Cortázar, talks about. He talks about excessive meaning when he talks about his own story. He says, a good story will always mean more than you can possibly say. So that there's an excess to art that is positive, excessive in the best sense of the word. Yeah. OK, let's just look at a few more pretty pictures. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. OK, we're going to see more de Chirico, though not as much as I, sh I should have shown to you. I, I, um, 
De Chirico is a repetitive artist. Once you've seen one De Chirico, this one, you're going to recognize De Chirico pretty easily. He loves in t the exterior spaces that feel interior, I mean, enclosed exterior space. So the, the columns that go back to nothing, those very, very distant people. And then, of course, the hyper-reality of the line, I mean, the hyper-clarity of, of the architectural details. And, of course, that very strong sun, which I might might argue is Baroque, even though this doesn't feel like Baroque painting at all. So, so De Chirico is one of, one of the very big ones. And then Otto Dix, Two Children, we've just seen him. I guess we'll just go ahead on the ones we've seen and then comment them a bit as we, we go. Oh, I need a laser pointer now, I remember. I wonder if, I notice here that, you know, we the animals, the details. This would be one that if we were looking at the cosmic and the the opposite of cosmic, the cosmic and the teeny beeny uh, leaf, we would have it here. This would be an example of a kind of altarpiece as uh, Roe described that altarpiece, a sense of an entire world of, of a considerable distance at the same time that we get the veins on the leaves. Well, you say he's just a great painter, that's all. Um, yeah, he is. And this woman with, it's just, I mean, we could say so much about this, the woman on this sort of uh, again, interior, exterior, this sofa, this divan, which clearly belongs in someone's living room, and yet here she is, but of course it's titled The Dream, so we uh, don't look for realism, even though the lines are exceedingly clear. These leaves have veins, but this is a dream, and there's an odd sofa, and a, a nude woman on it in the middle of a jungle with birds and monkeys and tigers and so forth. So you, you can uh, a analyze these. And I may ask you to, actually, I'm working away on our Vista site. And it's going to be fun to talk about some of these images once I get them on the site and I learn how to do discussion, which I'm going to learn shortly. So I'll ask you to go on and discuss some of these in your own terms. But here we have a very famous painting by Carl Grossberg. <laughs> What we have is a lot of still life and a lot of cityscape. You know, we do, we, Gross and Dix are the ones who give us the people walking along the street. But so much of this is this kind of palpitating object. So here you have a very odd, I mean, and it's very static. You say, well, where's the magic that hides and palpitates behind it? But it's very staticness suggests an excess, let's say, an other side, as he says. We can look at it from the other side and see things we hadn't seen. I'm just standing up here doing what I'd like you to think about doing, which is applying Franz Rose categories to this artwork, because that's how he started, except he started the other way. He took all these painters that seemed to him to be hyper-realists, neo-realists, getting away from abstractions, says, what can I say about them as a group, and what can I call them? So, so that's where we are. Here's the street scene. A certain irony here. I don't know. What do you all want to say about this? Anybody want to do us a reading of this particular painting? What do we make of it? I don't have the date handy on this one. Anybody want to comment on it? I know I have an art historian in the very back of the room because she told us what trompe l'oeil meant. You want to comment? No. OK. Anybody? OK, get up your nerve, guys. OK, now these are the ones we haven't seen. Again, the grotesque Otto Dix, the writer Sylvia von Harde. Self-portrait by Otto Dix. less stylized. I mean, if you compare it to the one we just saw, there's a kind of sense of a real live human being there <laughs> someplace in this one, whereas this one really does feel, we just have to say, oh, that's a very interesting painting, or that's a very grotesque, look at the hands, how the hands are, for example. So um, this feels more like your st <laughs> more like realism than magical realism, if we had to put a spectrum up and say which is the most magical real and which, which is the least according to Rose categories, this might be toward the lesser side. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say it really helps to have the, the slides because uh, I think Rose does a good job of describing some paintings um, in detail, but others, and when he's talking about paintings in a more general sense, yeah. it's 
kind of you're trying to imagine what, what he's talking about. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you are Catherine. Kathy. Kathy. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. You know, if I'd known more, if I'd known more. If I know, knew then what I know now, I would have put a lot of these pictures into the book. That was a huge mistake. And I had Irene's essay there, and I thought, well, that'll do it. But uh, now I wish I'd put a, at least six or seven examples, because it's so clear once you see that you know, object in mourning, the very first slide by Ra uh, Radzowell, you say, oh, yeah, that object does, mystery does hide and palpitate. Yeah, so thank you for that comment. Yes, ma'am. Would you tell me your name? My name is Lynn. Yeah, Lynn, please. Um, the, the red painting of the writer, Sylvia. Yeah, let's go back. It um, reminds me very much of uh, that silent movie, Nosferatu. Oh. And the butt the butt too, kind of looking in. That was, um, okay. isn't that a... Part of the same school, the same yes, yes, Fritz Lang, also Metropolis and all of, of that. Um, but I'm not so good at movies. Would you hold that thought very firmly in mind, Lynn, because we're going to have this two-week section of this course where we look at where you're going to go to the writing center and create something like a web-based paper that can go up on our class website. I'd love to have you pursue that connection. That would be great. Yeah, Tracy. Actually, I was kind of going to talk about that one, too. There's another painting yeah. at the MFA. I'm not sure what it's called, but it's upstairs at uh, the Audrey Brown, the back it, building. Back building, and, yeah. And um, it's yellow. It's a man. It's a self-portrait, and it's all yellow, and it's a man. He has kind of big, grotesque hands like that, and he's sitting on a couch. Mm. He's dressed in yellow. He's on a yellow chair. He has a yellow wall. It has that same kind of stylized feel about it. And do you think it might be Dix? It could it's well be. It's definitely not Otto Dix, but it's okay. a self-portrait. Um, I'm going to try and find out who it is. Yes, you very, hold that very thought. Very yeah. similar. Thank Around you. Around the same time, though, I think as um, that Otto Dix is yeah. painting. Yeah, I know the Beck collection rather well, and I'm not seeing that one at all. So um, anyway, I, and Tracy, at the end, remind me to say something more about the Museum of Fine Arts. I'm not going to interrupt us now, but I want you all to go see an exhibition that's right there, there, there at the moment. Any other comments about this one? OK, we'll go on. And I'm sorry, that's a type which should be Mother E.Y. And I don't know. I have to study up Otto Dix to know what this is about. But it's not I as in I. It's, you, you see, he's, and this is to me a parody as well as everything else. Do you, it, it's with the, her hand on that little, you know how noblemen were portrayed with hands on tables and great drapery behind them. It's very, that drapery is, is very typical of Baroque portraiture. And Baroque portraiture was nothing at all popular. It was about kings and queens and noble, uh, noblemen. So, so there's a kind of parody here of that sort of formal portrait. Um, and then, let's see, a couple, oh, now we're on to Rousseau. Rousseau is sh sheer fun. I don't know Rousseau's death date. I have to look into that. But all of these are uh, pretty early. I'm, uh, does anybody? No, of course you don't know. Oh, where's our um, encyclopedic person that we all need? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's something, I'm going to guess something like about 1918. Uh, he's earlier. And it's a diff different mode altogether, one senses, but very similar, his work, one work to another. Another one of these calm, quiet ones. I look twice to make sure this label is right. I need to look a third time. I, I, I feel certain it is. This is such an odd child, isn't it? <laughs> doesn't, uh, doesn't look like a child very much. You get the drapery again, but very stylized. It's a kind of reference to another sort of portraiture, but now it's, it's a parody. It's an, there's, a, there's a certain parody of, of the formal portrait here. Look at what he or I guess she is holding in her uh, hand. It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not any fancy walking stick. It's, uh, uh, it seems to be a stick that's rooting right there, speaking of imperturbable duration. Hard to know. Anybody want to read that for us, that stick? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Would you tell me your name? It's Anne. Anne. No, it's an airplane. 
Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what's hard to tell for me is what this is, what she's holding in her right hand. I, I need to get a good book of Rousseau and look very closely at what, what that is in her, her right hand. So um, I think it's an airplane. Does anybody want to argue that point? I've got to get a better slide of the. Is that a waterfall? It could be a bird. It could be a flesh and blood angel. <laughs> um, it, now that I, I've always thought it was an airplane, but now that you've asked, I believe it may well be a bird. It looks like a person. Maybe this is part of the point about the mystery that hides and palpitates behind the object. We aren't supposed to know exactly. And you see the, the flowers behind her on her little balcony and the, the rooftops and so forth, terribly stylized. That is, they aren't supposed, I mean, rooftops don't quite look like that. So. Um, but I'll, I'll look into the flying object question. Thank you for asking it. What is it on the left and your left or right? That's, that's what I can't tell. Oh, yeah, they're flowers. Are they flowers? <laughs> no, it's something else. No, the pot of flowers is behind her. It's something that's hanging like a keychain or something. And I bet if we saw the real thing, we could see in a minute. It, some sort of something. I mean, I thought at first it was glasses, but upon closer inspection, maybe it is. Yes, yes, yeah. Chris suggests that maybe it's the child. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Keep Henry Rousseau clearly in mind for your web projects. If anybody wants to answer all of these questions, and I'll try to do a better job of looking at this in in a book, at least that, pointing out the importance of going and seeing art. In reality, you can see so much more. And another, the, the merry jesters, we presume the monkeys in the foreground. Uh, there are four of them, one in the background, three in the foreground, but we take it to be the monkeys. Again, a kind of pastoral scene that's imperturbable duration, etc. Both the miniature and the entire forest, etc. We've already, I think, said, said those kinds of things about Rousseau. The flamingo. He's called in French le douanier. He was a customs, uh, <coughs> customs officer, which is interesting because so was uh, Hawthorne. <laughs> yes, Lynn. Uh, he's apparently, from what I remember from my art history classes, he um, is completely self-taught. He got mm -hmm. no formal training whatsoever yes. in painting. Thank you very much for, for reminding us of that. And, and you see how different he is. In a way, you can see that he's it's not quite Grandma Moses, but there's something so idiosyncratic about his work that one isn't surprised to know that he wasn't part of a, of, you know, a major conservatory or art school. Thank you. That's, that's a, a, a good point. And he worked all his life as a customs officer. Is that not the case? That's why he's called le douanier. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about all his life, but that's how he's known. Rousseau, le douanier. Yeah, Chris? It seems like Ooh, button. It seems like that same idea of like stasis in the painting. Mm -hmm. that they're all natural movement in the water or in mm -hmm. the air and yeah. the trees and yeah. everything. And that same thing with Schrempf doing yeah. the, the paintings in his own room and not looking out to nature for an example. I mean, it's all coming from internal uh, yeah. and it's all stasis. Yeah. There's no dynamic force yeah. except the artist. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. We'll see shrimp next time, and in fact, his his landscape is in Irene Gunther's essay, so you'll you'll get to uh, to see that. But yeah, this exchange between interior and exterior, it feels all very externalized, and yet here's the painter who's doing what is not any kind of natural landscape. So, so thank you. There's that, that exchange between interior and exterior, which Roe is very concerned about. He said before expressionism was all interior. Now we revalidated the natural world and the objective world, that is the world of objects as well. Okay, let's keep going here. Oh, what happened to IX? Oh, that's a very interesting... Uh, it used to be a picture. Isn't that funny? Uh, I, I'm fascinated by what, what's going on in my um, PowerPoint. Country wedding. This feels more Grandma Moses-like even than uh, 
much more than you know the the kind and the one that we just missed the artillerist is also some some little man in in uniform sitting on a cannon you know you could imagine uh, his um, being asked to uh, record this rural e event or this rural scene and here here again so and then this one horse attacked by a jaguar one more of the cosmic jungle scenes. Okay, and then we go to one of our grotesques, George Gross, Eclipse of the Sun. I think, I'm, I don't think we need to belabor reading these paintings here. We can see the industrialist, the military, the, it's a social allegory, much more engaged with social and political realities than it would seem that the others that we've seen, certainly than Rousseau, for example, is or, even, well, Dix, you'll see, is more so as well. But we, you see the skull and crossbones. I mean, it's, it's, it's there. The guys with the stuffed shirts, <laughs> making the metaphor literal on the left-hand side, the empty shirts, the dollar sign up in the left-hand corner. And now to another, we haven't seen Carl Grossberg, who does, I, I left some of the landscapes until the end white smoke, we see the white smoke in the foreground, it's hyper real again, it feels very static again. Um, the mystery according to Roe hides and palpitates behind. And it's true, it's, it, in a way it takes you in uh, and you wonder about it. Again, Carl Grossberg, oil tanks. And now, oh, I guess I did him twice, sorry about that. Now back to George Gross. Sorry, these aren't as well organized as they should be. This should be, f it's the drawing for <coughs> Felix, the Felix drawing for Methuselah. And I'm sorry about that, I'm gonna change it. So ignore the title, please. But here again, you see the kinds of, well, mechanical workings of this figure. The legs of brick, the insides that we see. And this is where, um, you know, Metropolis by Fritz Lang starts the mechanical self here. Um, but it's, it, let's put it this way, it's not a portrait like we're used to. <laughs> this is something that's saying, we can call it magical realism, that's what Franz Roll called it. He's saying it's asking us to think about our, the self and about the world in ways that we haven't. Uh, and so this figure made basically of building construction materials. So. And then this nice still life by Gross, you know, not, uh, he's our grotesque, and it's certainly not a still like life like the one we started with, which is beautiful. This has still got a kind of grotesquerie, the puppets and the toys, that, the, the noise maker, etc. But still, the colors are fabulous. So there's that. And now we started with Franz Radziwill, Radziwill with the beautiful objects and mourning, or is it, yeah, objects and mourning. And now a couple, I'll show you a couple of his uh, landscapes, let's say, or in this case, seascapes, the frozen sea, a dock, the airplane. This one called Strike 1931. Again, a certain, you know, if you saw enough of these, you'd say, oh, that is of that moment, and that's why I'm fascinated with the man in the yellow coat, Tracy. I mean, there's a, there's a real recognizable feel to this. It's not at all French Impressionism. It's not at all Expressionism. It's certainly not Surrealism. You know, Salvador Dali does not fit with this crowd at all. But there's a, there's a kind of coherence about the painters that Franz Roe chooses to label magical realist, even though they're a rather different one from the other. And another Radziwill houses, it's really supposed to be back houses in Dresden, it's the alleyway, and that's a painting that Irene Gunther talks about a lot in her, um, her essay, which you will read for next, next time. So, that may be the end. Let me just, oh, now let's see. Now I'm going to do, I'll just run through these real quick one more time so they're fixed in your in your, your visual memory. Again, the interesting use of curtains. I'm into curtains. I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of the Baroque, and um, the Baroque uses draperies, as you know. Uh, 
Okay. Mm -mm. He's an expressionist. He comes before and he's one of those ones with all that activity that isn't at all the kind of calm that, yeah, yeah, he's, he's before and he's an expressionist. Kokoschka, if you know the Polish painter. Oh, would you press the button? Oh, find a button. We want to. We want our viewing public to, <laughs> to hear you. I think uh, one of the paintings where the woman's in the jungle is the cover of Love in the Time of Cholera. Oh, thank Isn't you for it? pointing that out. Isn't it? It could be. It could be. Love in the Time of Cholera could well be. I think it may be a kind of echo of Rousseau because there are lots of fronds, but. I, Anyway, we'll take a look at our cover and see. Thank you. It is very Gar Garcia Marquezian, isn't it? Um, the, the feel. In fact, now that you mention it, it's perfectly Garcia Marquezian. <laughs> So as different as these painters are one from another, Rowe persuades me anyway that they have something deeply in common. And it is their handling of the objective world, according to Rowe. And it helps me as a viewer to say, what do these things have in common uh, when I read Rowe and I find him to be persuasive. So um, at least now you've gotten a good look at some of the artists. Canolt still is absent for, and shrimp, but you'll see them uh, next time for our essay for next next week. I mean, what am I saying next week? Next class time. But I'm going to let you go now. And any general comments or questions? OK, carry on with Irene Gunn. Oh, here's one. Oh, Tracy, thank you. Tracy reminds me. Do you have, have you seen that at the MFA there's a fabulous, huge exhibition of Latin American art? Yes. Yeah. It was hugely reviewed in the New York Times on Friday and celebrated. It's been celebrated a lot. I actually haven't seen it because I was out of town until the very uh, end of the summer, but I can't wait to see it. It closes September 12th. And I can't make you go, I can't insist, but I'll be glad to give you extra credit if you go and just tell me uh, a bit what you saw, maybe a piece or two that was particularly attractive to you. It's very important to me that you go, if I'd thought of it, I would have put it on the, um, on the syllabus, but I, I didn't. And in fact, I may yet actually require that you go. I'll, I'll contemplate that and tell you. It's only here till the 12th of September. If it's a, Yes. Free on Thursdays. Thank you very much. Yes. So, so see if even this Thursday uh, you could could check it out. Oh, that's a good point too. Yeah. Yeah.